Welcome to episode 180 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing screenwriter Tom Hines, who wrote the film Mother's Day, which stars Julia Roberts and Jennifer Aniston, among many others. He's had a long career working with the great director and producer Gary Marshall, and we talked through exactly how he got his start with Mr. Marshall. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 180. I continually build out the SYS script library. This past week, we um, we added a whole bunch of new scripts. I want to thank um, Sylvia Marie Llewellyn, who sent us the script for Man on Fire. That's been added to the library. I want to thank Drew Helmick, who sent us the scripts for Aliens and Jeepers Creepers. I want to thank Sean M. Smith, who sent us the script for It Follows. And we also added some of the Academy Award winning screenplays, Moonlight Jackie, The Girl on the Train. So all those are now in the SYS script library. Library. If you have a screenplay that you do not see listed in the script library, please do email it to me. The SYS script library is completely free. We have well over a thousand scripts in the library, many hit movies and award winners and television shows. All the scripts are in PDF format so you can download and read them on whatever device you use. So just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash library. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash library. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Again, if you want to download that free guide, just go to to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Quick few words about what I'm working on. Once again, I'm still working on post-production on my crime action thriller feature film, The Pinch. Things are moving along slowly but surely. My special effects guys have been knocking out various shots, so that's coming along very nicely. I got a first pass last week from my sound designer, so that was cool to hear. On set, you know, just this was micro budget, so we basically just had plastic guns on set that made no noise. There were no blanks. I mean, all of that stuff, um, shooting blanks and having muzzle flash and that kind of thing, those things are all dangerous. Even though you're not shooting bullets, you're still using something that, you know, isn't explosive. So all we had on our set was just plastic guns, so the actors would just pretend to, you know, fire when it was appropriate to, to fire the gun, so there was no sound needless to say these guns were making and there was no muzzle flash or smoke and that's what my special effects guys have done they've added in the muzzle flash and smoke and then, <clears throat> and then this past week my sound designer went in and added in you know real gunshot sounds to the sound mix um, and so it was just really interesting and he did a lot more than just gunshots but it was that was probably the most noticeable thing is the gunfights actually feel a lot more real now where you actually hear real sounding guns um, you know as the action is taking place so it's just really great to see that um, it was exciting and it gave the film at least for me who's now seen it you know a hundred times it gives the film sort of new life and makes it interesting for me to watch again um, now that these sounds are getting in so that's all great I also even Email with my composer last week. He's just about done his first pass. Um, hopefully, I'll get something from him this week. So again, slowly but surely, these different pieces of post-production are coming together. I really do feel like I'm on the home stretch. Everything always goes slower than you'd want it, but um, I do feel like I'm making forward progress, so that's good. I think when I went into post-production last August, I basically shot this film last July. We started post-production pretty much immediately after it, it wrapped, so that was last August. I was hoping to have this done. I think that was what I came on the podcast in like last August, September, saying, oh, I hope I have to be done in January. Obviously, I'm, I'm way behind schedule as far as that goes. At this point, I'm very hesitant to even give an ETA, but I'd say at this point, I'm 
kind of shooting for August. I'll probably be lucky to be done by the end of August, but that's kind of roughly what I'm going for. And I'm really trying to turn things up and, and push hard on that. I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'm trying to give everyone who's working on this in post-production enough time to do a really good job. Doing a good job is more important to me than getting it done quickly. So I'm just not going to push these guys. You know, I'm not paying them very much and a lot of them have other jobs to do. Um, so I just, I just want them to have the time to feel like that they can do a good job as opposed to, oh, I got to hit this sort of arbitrary deadline. Um, so that's kind of my philosophy. And as I said, it's, it does feel like things are moving along forward. So I don't feel like at this point um, I'm that far behind. Or there's really, it's really a big deal whether I finish in August or frankly, October or November. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's more now it's just psychological for me. I want to get done and I want to move on to my next project. I mentioned a few weeks ago on the podcast my spec horror thriller script. I'm still plugging away on that, just polishing it up. I have a decent draft done, um, and I've just been spending the last week or two just kind of cleaning up that draft. I brought the um, second 28 pages or so into my writer's group, got notes on that. So now I have notes from my writer's group on about half the script. So that's given me a bunch of new notes to go in and, um, and implement. It needs, I would say, if I'm going to shoot this myself on a micro budget, it definitely needs quite a bit of work. And the biggest thing is um, cutting it down. Right now it's 107 pages, which for a micro budget film is just way, way, way too long. Um, and this is a very important thing. I mean, if your script is 110 pages and you're submitting it to a studio or even, you know, an independent production company that has, you know, a decent budget for a film, 107 pages is, is perfectly fine. There's no, that's not too long and there, there'd be no problem. But if you're going to shoot something micro budget, if you want it to be a feature, I would say 90 pages is kind of that sweet spot, maybe even a little less, like 88, 86. And this thing at, at 107 pages is just way too long. I mean, with a micro budget film, every pay, I mean, with every film, but especially when budget is super, super tight you've got to get the thing down um, as as much as possible because um, every page you have is just another page that you have to film and and if you have if I can cut you know 10 or 15 pages out of this script um, on a 15 day shooting schedule just to make the math easy say I cut 15 pages out um, that's a page a day and you're only shooting like five six pages a day so cutting one page out of each one of those days is a huge amount of, of shooting um, you want to be somewhat careful and this is sort of my dilemma I'm going through the script and I'm looking at it there's not a huge savings in cutting the length of scene so if you have a four page scene or let's say you have a three page scene and you cut it down to two pages that's not going to save you a huge amount of time because once you got everything set up if it's like two actors talking taking a dialogue scene that's three pages and cutting it down to two pages that's not a huge saving removing whole plots, removing subplots, removing, you know, whole scenes, locations. That's where you save because it's whole different setups. Once you get the two actors in place, you get the camera set up. It's not that big of a deal whether the scene is two pages or frankly 10 pages because once you're in the flow of shooting, it's not going to take you that much longer. But anyways, all that to say is that if I'm going to shoot this micro budget, I would definitely need to um, circle back and just cut this thing way, way down. And I'm not at this point sure exactly where that's going to be. So I'm just not kind of worrying about it right now um, I'm going to just finish it up here in the next week or two and then set it aside and then I'll come back to it um, probably once I'm finished with the pinch my original goal was to have the script done around the time the pinch was done so that I could kind of figure out what I was going to do next obviously that's not going to happen the script is going to be done and um, and the pinch pinch obviously won't be so I've got a little bit of time it's certainly no rush but um, that's kind of my thinking now is I just I have to be 100% done with the pinch before I start thinking about producing something else. Um, it just doesn't make sense to move on and just just creatively and everything else. I've just got to see the pinch done. And as I said, just get it so it's 100% done and um, submitted to film festivals and, you know, maybe some distributors and, and started to really push that out there before I get going on producing something else. But in the meantime, I have been circling some writing assignments. I've been talking with a producer about writing a script for him, so that might be my next writing project. I can certainly do that while I'm finishing up the pinch. So that's kind of my thinking now. I'm still a long ways from, from finalizing that, but um, I'm thinking that's probably my next move is I will take a writing assignment from this producer, um, assuming things go as, as I hope that they will. Um, you never know in this business. Things can always fall through, but um, that's kind of my thinking now is I'm going to take this writing assignment, work on that for a few more months while. While, um, while the pinch finishes up and then I'll be in a good position to kind of figure out where I'm at. I really don't want to shortchange the pinch. I, I want to get it done and producing something is just such a huge effort. 
um, I want to get the pinch done and really submit it to film festivals and just take it out and market it. Talk to distributors, go to the film festivals, and really give it a chance to, um, I mean, I put all this hard work into it. So before I really get wrapped up in another project, just give it a chance to, um, to breathe and, and live and kind of see where it's going to be. Anyways, that's what I'm working on. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing screenwriter Tom Hines. Here's the interview. Welcome, Tom, to the Selling You Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ashley. Thank you. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Uh, well, I grew up actually just out about 30 minutes outside of Boston was where I, where I was raised, but then... Uh, Went to college right in town there, Boston College, and as a kid, was always making movies with a friend of mine who went to Emerson College, which is a pretty popular uh, communication school in Boston. But my, my dad had said, when I considered Emerson, he said, you have no idea what you want to do. He said, you're going to go to Emerson, then you're going to have to transfer when you realize you don't want to make movies. I said, okay. <laughs> so I, I went to Boston College and had a lot of fun for four years. And I actually got my first job in LA at BC. Met someone at, at BC, who was out in LA and they were doing a show in town and ran into, they said, why don't you come out and check out the show? And it was uh, called Comic Strip Live Primetime. And it was a fo old Fox show, uh, live comedy. And they had nobody there. All these people from LA, nobody knew Boston. So they hired me as a PA. Hmm. And I went out and did, made a green room for the comedians did all the shopping, and it was really like this wonderful opportunity when I was in college to go do that. And when it was over, the guy said, hey, you, you ever come to LA, you got a job. And so I graduated that summer and packed up a truck and moved to LA. And do, were you able to get a job through him? I, I worked for him for about two months, and then he quit the biz, as they say, uh -huh. and he uh, moved to Manhattan Beach to go surfing. So apparently he made money in something else. <laughs> and I uh, stumbled into some ac an acting class. And long story short, with the dog interruption, uh, I started taking an acting class and I was waiting tables. And I met uh, writer, producer, director Gary Marshall. Uh, probably like my first year of waiting tables and his production company was right next door. And he said, well, you know, you, you, you're a good waiter. You do anything else? And I said, well, you know, I act a little. And, and he actually called me in. You know, you go to L.A. and a lot of people make promises. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't know him from Adam, but they say, hey, I want you to audition for this film. Hey, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I heard that a million times. And then someone who actually was making things, Gary Marshall, says, you'll come audition. And and he actually called and I went and I auditioned for him and did some acting in a couple of films still, you know, still at the restaurant. And one day he just said, you know, you're not such a good actor. You should try other things. And I said, oh, OK, come work at the office. You'll come, you'll hang out, you'll read a script. Maybe you can learn something else. And he really took me under his wing and. I became an assistant on films like Runaway Bride, and he also still let me act because I was there and available. It's not that you're talented, but I know you're here because you have to be here every morning, and you won't make a noise because I'll yell at you. And But he also let me write jokes. Some great writers, Marty Nadler. I mean, Gary created Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, mm -hmm. Mork and Mindy, these great TV shows that I got to grow up with. And he always would have these punch-up writers on set and Marty Nadler, Bob Brunner, these guys that wrote on Happy Days, great joke writers, funny, on the fly. Gary liked having them on set because if an actor was struggling with a line or the scene just was flat, you write a note or a joke on a piece of paper and, and he'd take a shot. Mm -hmm. And Gary might change the scene and sometimes it worked, but he, would, he was one of the few that actually kept on set writers. And that was really how my writing career took off. Okay. So when you moved to LA, what was your intention? Um, all your experience was just basically being a PA. Did you say I'm going to be an actor or was just, I got nothing better to do. I'll go out there and see what happens. Did you want to be a writer? I, the one thing I thought I could do was act. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary said very quickly, you can't act. <laughs> and, and just being around him, I found my real love was directing. Okay. I remember on Runaway Bride, I got to sit 
Baltimore, Maryland, he'd say, if you don't say a word, you can sit in when I'm talking to Julia Roberts and Richard Gere. And I'd sit and I'd listen to him talk to these actors and really find out what the scene was about and get their take on it and really find that scene. Here's the scene that we wrote. Now what's the scene? And that's what I really loved because I love talented actors. I love working with talented actors because they can do it so much better than I ever could. And that's really, I thought my purpose was acting. <laughs> Realized quickly it was not. Mm -hmm. And Gary really helped me realize that writing and directing was, was really where, where my love was. Yeah. So let's just talk about this just for a second, this relationship with Gary Marshall. Um, was there something like that you did to um, endear him to you? I mean, what was that? Why did he pick you out of the millions of other kids that were waiting tables? Um, did you follow up with him? Did you just, was there something you did or just sort of just pure, you know, happenstance? I, I think it was a lot of happenstance. I mean, he was allergic to a lot of things, apparently deathly allergic to uh, vinegar and mustard, not deathly, but it would make him swell up. And he always remembered, I never brought mustard to the table. I don't know, maybe other people did. Huh. And But, you know, I, I left him alone, I think. I was never pushy. I didn't want to be pushy. And he was really, you know, and we probably developed a relationship over about six or seven months. And he was just coming off of Frankie and Johnny. And he was about to do uh, The Other Sister, or Exit to Eden. I'm sorry, that was my first film with him, was Exit to Eden. You may not remember it, but it was right after Tom Cruise did an interview with a vampire. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. an Anne Rice novel called Exit to Eden. Huh. It so wrote interview, but then they made it into a comedy starring Rosie O'Donnell and Dan Aykroyd. It is not well received, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say. So, yeah. so then let's go ahead and let's start moving into sort of the writing. Um, how did you segue into um, writing and, and maybe we could eventually sp specifically get to Mother's Day? Mm -hmm. uh, it was really Gary being encouraging. When I started, I would work in the office. He'd say, if you're not bar, if you're not waiting tables, come to the office. So if I wasn't working at the bar, I would go to the office, which was right next door, and read a script. I, 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 he said, read a script, then you'll do a coverage. I'm like, a coverage? Okay, I don't know. They gave me some sample coverages. I read coverages. And then I read a script. I read probably four or five scripts, and just kind of, and then I found one I thought I liked. And I said, I said, Gary, I, I read one I, I liked. Well, good, you'll write a coverage. And I was walking out of the office, and, and I, was, I was in the office, and he said, good, write a coverage. I said, I think I could really pitch it to you right now. And you could see on his face, he's like, bad idea. <laughs> and, and he said, sure, let's see what you got. And I proceed to for about a minute, probably babble on of what, blah, 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 blah. And then the story begins with, and I probably wasn't even out of page two, and he stops and he says, stop, 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 stop. Do you know what an arc is, Tommy? I'm like, a, a, an arc? He's like, a character arc. You can't even tell a story. Go write it down. <laughs> and he, he explained the arc of a character and I and, and explained really how to pitch a script as opposed to just ramble on in a big summary. Mm -hmm. And and from there, I, I started writing out coverages reading more scripts, where I think, think I learned more than anything, reading scripts, scripts that were getting made, scripts that were uh, just being handed to Gary on the street, and some that were not very good, but still had money behind them. You, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And then eventually on set, he would say, as an assistant, once he hired me as an assistant on Runaway Bride, he would say, if you got a joke or something, tell Marty. And Marty Nadler is this guy. Marty was with Gary since the beginning of Happy Days, and he's still around, and Marty was a great mentor to me. If you got something, run it by Marty. And I would always run my jokes by Marty, and he'd explain why something was funny, why something worked, why it had nothing to do with the scene. You know, you think you got a funny line. It has nothing to do with the scene. And, and this is the great thing about people like Gary and Marty. It was on Princess Diaries, the first one. Princess Diaries, and I wrote a joke, and it was a scene with Larry Miller and Anne Hathaway, and Larry Miller was playing Paolo, this guy who is Princess Anne Hathaway's hairdresser, and he's funny and over the top, and they had these big pom-pom things in her hair, big like like Princess Leia rolls in her hair, and it was part of their uh, makeup montage, like the whole do-over montage. Mm -hmm. 
when uh, and I wrote it was two it might have been Princess Diaries two, and I wrote a joke, and I handed it to Marty, and it said, "I look like a moose," and that was my line that I thought would be funny for Anne Hathaway. And now it had been a year or two of me writing jokes for Marty and Gary, and Marty would tell me why something was funny, why something was. And Marty was like, that's not bad, that's not bad. And Marty took it to Gary, and Gary looked at it, he chuckled, and Marty didn't go good and like give me an invisible thumbs up. He says, that was Tommy's, that was Tommy's joke. And he points right at me, and Gary looks at me, he goes, huh. And at the end of that day, and that scene made it in the movie, that joke made it in the movie. And at the end of that day, Gary said, so maybe you do some writing, we got some things coming up. And he said, take a look at the script. If you have something funny you want to write tomorrow, put it on a list, hand it to me in the morning. And that's what I said. And that was when it began. Now, I would had, write you, had you started to write scripts in your spare time? Had you started to, how many jokes do you think you had written that had been, you know, maybe just rejected before you came up with this one that got accepted? A ton, you know, a ton. And I had probably started a couple of scripts, but I never, I didn't understand it. You know, I'd read scripts at that point, but I never really, you know, I didn't read Sid Field or, or Robert McKee. And it was all, everything I was learning was Gary Marshall and mm -hmm. script and which was a great school to go to. And, but I never had that. I never had that idea that I could finish. But once he gave me that, and then I wrote a scene uh, for Stan Lee in Princess Diaries too, I don't even remember the you know Marvel comics. Stan Lee, yeah, big yeah, sure, Stan. Sure. Him and Gary went. They both went to DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. So hmm. I had put them together, and and Gary said, "I got Stan Lee coming tomorrow. I want you to write a scene for him." And I did. It went and stayed in the movie, you know. And it was because he had no idea what to do with Stan Lee. And I did a three joke, three Stooges bit, and so it went from a joke to a scene, and then finally a scene. I had to a script after a film I had after he had done Raising Helen and I had went off to produce a low budget independent film that was a great experience and a great opportunity and Gary knew it that's why he said go do that you come back you come back to work and when I showed him that film he said good I got a script somebody wrote not good maybe you take a shot and that was the first time and I read a script it was a, a book called Winning Sounds Like This it was a story about Gallaudet University's deaf girls basketball team and their incredible 1998 season when they went to the Sweet 16 of the Division III uh, National NCAA Tournament basketball. And I just found what I thought was the movie. And the guy, who, the person who had hired to write the script missed. It was more of a, I'm copying the book, something I would have done, you know, 10 years beforehand. Well, I'll just take the book and I'll copy it into 110 pages. Mm -hmm. And so I had an idea and I wrote out about a 14 page treatment, probably my first one ever, he handed it to him, he read it and he said, good. And then he hired me to write that script, which, which I still sit on today and hope to someday make. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then take us through then how many more opportunities were there before you actually got to mother's day? <sighs> well, in between that I went and I directed a, a film of my own and was always shopping, um, uh, Mother's Day, or uh, always shopping, winning sounds like this, my basketball script. And then on uh, Gary had a, during that time, we'd sit down and Gary, Gary would always have a writing team. He had Bob Brunner and Marty Nadler. Bob since uh, passed away. Bob actually helped me write winning sounds like this. That's again, Gary mentoring me through his friends. And he says, I'm going to put you with Brunner. He's lonely and he's funny and he knows how to write a script. And I wrote it with Bob Brunner. And again, a great experience. This is a guy who, this was past the age of copy and pasting. And I was sitting in a room with Bob and Bob would literally be with scissors, cutting out the old scene that we wrote and then taping it or pasting it across the piece of paper we were working on, physically cutting and pasting. Huh, wow. And so that was, you know, that was part of my winning sounds like this experience. And then we did, Gary did films like Valentine's Day and New Year's Eve. And at that point, Bob had retired, Marty was had retired, and so myself and Matt Walker, who was another person that Gary liked to use quite often, a very talented writer and performer at Gary's Theater in Burbank, he brought us in. He said, so we're going to write a script. I got a script. I'm doing a movie Valentine's Day. It's not the right script. So he would he'd say, this is, and then you really would write it to cater to Gary's sensibilities. Okay. And those were really my first opportunities to really write through a script after winning sounds like this. Okay, and that was then what turned into be Mother's Day? 
Well, Valentine's Day and New Year's Eve, we arbitrated on both. Matt and I didn't get credit. Okay, Arbitration. Okay, okay, okay. I see. So you were writing on all these scripts all along. Writing on all those scripts before, and then we were on-set writers. I was an on-set writer on Valentine's Day and New Year's Eve as well. And Mother's Day was really supposed to be our, you know, Gary said, this is it. He even said, he said, I'm not doing Mother's Day. But if I do, you guys are going to be first in on the script. And the producers, and we're like, well, okay. But he said, but again, I'm not doing it. He said, that's okay, Gary. And Matt and I went to a meeting, and the producers, he said, well, the producers are coming. So maybe we are going to do it. I don't know. They'll kill me if I do another holiday movie. And, and, uh, and the producers came in, and the producers came in with a script already. Okay. <laughs> you know, it was one of those. And Gary, even Gary's like, ah, he said, they got us. I'm like, well, they got us for sure. So Mother's Day, when it began, was initially in Gary's eyes was going to be, hey, this is yours and Matt. Matt and you, this is your turn to, to be first in, to be there right from the start and right with me, always with Gary. And we'll make a script we want to make. And then, of course, the producers roll in with, here's a script. <laughs> and Gary says, not the one I want to make. So we, we pretty much rewrote from page one, Mother's Day, and in a, in a many, 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 many versions, as you know, yeah, you yeah. know, it, over three years, over the course of three years, many mm -hmm. different versions. Yeah. So as your career is progressing and you're starting to get these um, assignments through Gary, at, at, did you try and get an agent or a manager? Did you start to try and branch out from, from that? You know, I had one agent and, uh, and you know, God bless her. She, uh, you know, it, it just, it's hard. Look, I mean, I know I'm nobody in the eyes of anybody except for Gary Marshall, you know, and that team and that inner circle, and there's nothing, you know, and it was a fantastic place to be. But, you know, as a, you know, as an onset writer, as somebody who had one script, and that's again, like you'll, you'll, like you'll say, write scripts, write scripts. You have to have more of that, you know, have more than one. Mm -hmm. You know, I had winning sounds like this to show and, shop a little bit but then you know it was usually well nobody likes nobody's gonna make a sports movie and deaf girls basketball are you crazy so I did, all right i'll make it on my own someday and uh but the one agent i had it, it, it wasn't gonna it wasn't working the meetings in essence i could have gotten you know just with people i knew and it wasn't her fault yeah. but that was the best shot i had and then i really just kind of realized this is this is my world it's my independent world i'm gonna have to figure it out for myself and on mother's day i probably could have went out and got an agent but i it, it, at that point i was kind of already not uh not too keen on it hmm. okay i wonder if um and, and maybe this isn't something that you were necessarily involved in but i wonder if you can talk a little bit and obviously it's a little different having gary marshall you know on the project but i wonder if you can talk a little bit about the cast and um how important getting that cast involved and how important that is to a project like mother's day um obviously you know having someone like julia roberts who's literally won an academy award well regarded jennifer anston you know has a good track record kate hudson getting some of those people involved maybe talk about number one how to how you guys got them and then number two how important that is to a project well it's huge obviously when you've got but you know with the model that a lot of people use now you know you've got this money and that there's but they're not going to release it until they got a, somebody that's going to get you worldwide and julia was that worldwide and they were saying jennifer anston was kind of the worldwide but maybe not you know the and in essence well like, quite honestly gary ran into julia at a, in Malibu at a baseball game, at his grandson's baseball game. She was at her son's baseball game. And it was kind of just worlds collided because the script had been shopped uh, at one time or another. You know, one version had been shopped. I personally felt it was too early. I'm like, I don't think it's ready, but they're ready to go. We're sending it out. And it got flat rejected from the actors. Nobody wanted to attach themselves to it, even though there was money there. And then Gary ran into Julia. And Gary had stepped away from the project for a minute. And Julie said, what are you doing, Gary, these days? He said, well, I'm thinking about doing Mother's Day. And she said, oh, well, you know, I might have a window. I'd love to work with you. Oh, yeah, well, I'll send you the script. We'll see. And he called her and he got her the script. And she read it. And she said, oh, I think I could play the, you know, I could, I could play something in this. 
Gary, if we can make it work, he called the producers and that was it. That set everything in motion. Okay, what do we need to do to get Julie on board? Once they heard Julie was on board, Jennifer was on board, and it, and that that's the only time. It was Gary. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd love to say it was the script, but you've probably seen Rotten Tomatoes or read the reviews. It certainly wasn't the script. It was <laughs> Gary. You know, Gary made it happen, and that was the great thing about him. People showed up because they wanted to work with Gary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was yeah. the really cool thing. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the collaborative process. I've written with other people, and I'm always just curious to kind of hear how collaborations go down. Maybe you can talk just a little bit about that. Um, are you guys, you know, do you typically work when you're collaborating in the same room? Um, you mentioned um, a, another fellow who you wrote this, who you got worked on on Mother's Day with. Are you guys in the same room? Do you guys divide up the scenes? You outline first, divide up the scenes. Maybe just walk through that process a little bit. We, we had a cool system. Matt Walker. And and myself and Gary, uh, Gary would kind of he'd be in the room. We'd all sit in the room. We'd go through the script, we'd, and then we would kind of break up the script. And we'd go. Gary'd say, "Well, we got to work on this scene," and Matt would write us. Matt and I would both work on the scene, and Gary would work on his version. And sorry, my dog is whining at me. That's okay. And. Uh, and then we'd send them to Gary. Gary would pencil them up, and then he would usually like rewrite them with with a like in a just an amalgam of whatever he liked. You know, sometimes somebody had a better you know a better you know a better through line for the particular scene. You know, but Gary liked a joke, and Gary he'd sit there with Gary, and he'd be reading quietly, and then you'd hear ha, you know, and then you knew okay, so he'd make a note, and he was a genius at. At, at blending it all together and making it work for him. I mean, that's we wrote for him. We wanted to make sure it worked for him. Yeah. And yeah. that was usually the process. Other times, Matt and I would go away and write. Uh, we would just, we'd be working on the script and Gary, we'd have, you know, maybe the first 30, 40 pages of, you know, of the original draft. And we just usually tended to write different scenes. We'd walk in and be like, what'd you work on? Well, I worked on this. It's like, good, because I worked on the other one. You know, and that was pretty wild. I was think that was one way that Matt and I worked pretty well together. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious how you handle... Um you know, when when you and maybe even take it back to pitching jokes to Marty, um, but even in, in the situation with Gary where maybe you've written scenes, how do you t- how do you kind of take the rejection when you've written something you think is really good, but they're like, nah, this isn't going to work. And I, I one of the first I ran into a radio writer when I first got to L.A. and he would write morning bits. And I was like, oh, I'll write some jokes for you. And I started writing these jokes that I saw, thought were hilarious. And he would look at him and say, no, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. And it was just like, what? those are great and how do you handle that um there's there had to have been moments where you disagreed with gary um but you know how do you navigate that water and not be rude and still maintain a a professionalism to it you know you you do have to you do take it on the chin as 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 you know and but gary was always good matt matt would have this good matt had a good a good joke that we would do uh you'd pitch a scene you'd pitch a joke and Gary or Matt or myself, if we didn't like it in general, we would lightheartedly yell, pull. And then you just, you know, just like you're skeet shooting. So you pitch a joke and you'd wait for it and you'd hear, pull. Okay, moving on. You know, you, you just got to take it. All right, fine. You don't like it. And the one time, the story, if I may, the best story that sticks out, which was just on New Year's Eve, I had written a cougar joke for Michelle Pfeiffer. And, and Gary, I think, was having a bad day. And I wrote a cougar joke. It's Michelle Pfeiffer and Zach Efron are in the storyline. So the age difference, you know, it says cougar. Gary says, he reads it. And we're on set. We're in New York City. We're on set, on set. And he says, Tommy, you can't write for stars. And I'm like, what? Huh? huh? You can't write for stars. You think Michelle Pfeiffer wants to hear a cougar joke? And I'm like, well, in the scheme of things, she's, you know, it's Zac Efron. I didn't even say that, but in my head, I'm like, and then I was kind of like, well, I guess she's probably 10, 15 years younger than Gary. So maybe he doesn't think cougar. I don't know. You know, she's still a spring chicken. And and, and he said, uh, and, I, and I, I turned beet red. That was the only time I ever, I was like, oh, I knew he was upset about something. 
and the cougar joke did not fly at all. And to this day, I feel it was a good joke, uh-huh. you know. And and I remember saying it, but I, it wasn't the time to fight about it. I had directed a film with uh, Brian Dennehy uh, in uh, 2010, and he said, and Gary said, he said, "Did you write fat guy walks down the street and handed to Brian Dennehy?" <laughs> I'm like, hey. Oh, man. So yeah. I think I spent some time just sitting in my chair that day <laughs> feeling sorry for myself. But, you know, Gary always knew, too. He'd be like, good work at the end of the day. You guys do good. I'm sorry if, you know. But I, I still don't think he ever thought the cougar joke was funny either. So, <laughs> so you sometimes you just miss, but yeah. you think, you, you know, but yeah. So let's talk about now, you live in Michigan. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, I get people emailing me all the time. Um, hey, can I start a career or have a career outside of LA? Um, and maybe we can just get your thoughts on that. Um, what have you been able to do since you've left LA and, and what was sort of part of your decision for leaving? And maybe just run through some of your thoughts on whether you writers should live in LA or not. You know, I had a, my nephew, Alex, called me I was still in L.A. and he calls me. He was a junior in college. And he says, hey, Uncle Tom, I'm thinking about dropping out of school and moving to L.A. to be a writer. And I was still in L.A. and I'm like, Alex, what's your major? He said business. I'm like, OK, well, why don't you get that degree? Because a business major nowadays means you can create a business, work on your phone. I'm like, you could sit in every coffee shop in L.A. and write. And run your business. I said, most people are sitting there like me, a bunch of schmucks, saying, you know, hoping, praying, you know, somebody walks in, they know. I said, finish school, you know, and then come to L.A. I absolutely encourage people to go to L.A. And I saw on your website, you said the same, you know, L.A. is, is the place to be. Mm-hmm. But for me at my age and, and with myself, my wife grew up in Michigan. I grew up in a small town in Boston. And with when our two kids were born, L.A. just changed a little bit for us. And I'm like, you know, you, you start to figure out, I'm like, I don't know, is this where they're going to make their lifelong friends? Is this where we want them to be? Do we want them to grow up in big city or we want small town? And we pretty much just decided small town. We want to raise our kids. We want our kids to have a small town experience. Mm-hmm. So we're going to pack up and go before they make their lifelong friends. So we pulled the trigger pretty fast. And that decision overrode everything else. In fact, Mother's Day was done. It, was, it wasn't even happening when we moved. And then I got a call. That was the Monroe County Fair. The county fair, and they're judging pigs. And I get a call from somebody in travel in Atlanta. I said, hey, it's so-and-so from uh, travel coordinator for Mother's Day. And I'm like, hi, really? For Mother's Day? It was literally that bizarre. So we want you to come down next week. Gary wants you down here. I'm like, oh, is it happening? And so, you know, it happened when I wasn't even in L.A., which was great. Uh, but for me as well, like I said, I left not worrying about anything. And certainly when I left, nobody was saying, please don't go. L.A. is a big town. They weren't like, oh, no, Heinz is leaving. They, you know, they're like, good, good. One last car in the 405. <laughs> and uh, and for me, I really made that decision. I made, as, a, as an independent filmmaker, I directed two films. And I feel I've learned a lot. I learned a lot. And I knew that when I left, I would have to do other things to, to support you know, my family. But I also knew that I would still make films. Mm-hmm. And so leaving wasn't that difficult for me because I knew what I wanted to do. I had enough focus. I had enough experience. And I knew also I, one of my films I made was in Flint, Michigan when I was still in L.A., and I knew how deep the talent pool here was in terms of actors. When I taught an acting class here, uh, and then we started this writer's workshop, I just started this writer's workshop because people were reaching out to me and saying, you know, I wrote a script. I'm like, well, let me read it. And I read it, and then I'd give notes. And then some of these people, they'd turn around the script. They'd turn around in like um, three weeks. I just I rewrote it. I'm like, holy mackerel. I was on f- uh, draft five with this one kid who's writing this wrestling script. And a few other people came around. And I said, well, we should start a writer's group because I can't keep, you know, just and not just because I can't, you know, I I can't just read all these scripts and give all my perfect opinions. I mean, you need a, you know, it takes a village sometimes. And so we created this great group with really positive feedback to help all these writers. I've got about 15 writers right now uh, and actors in a group. We meet every Sunday and we're developing a few things out of that. 
And is and that your plan now is to try and um, get a script that you can shoot and direct independently? Yep. That's yep. And I'm still writing. I'm writing for one of the Mother's Day producers, Howard Bird. I'm writing a script for him. We we touch base. He's in Sacramento and we're writing a kind of a fun comedy. And so I'm not totally out of the loop there, mm-hmm. but really my focus has been trying to find that stuff and have do what I got to do to pay the bills mm-hmm. so that what I make next time, I have more control over. Because I'm at that point in my career, you know, I've really only had say in one project. And it was the first film I directed. And my brother, brilliant writer, wrote that script. Hmm. And after that, you know, it becomes producers and, you know, and everybody else that, that has their opinions. And you, like I had said on Mother's Day, I felt that draft wasn't ready to go. But who am I to say? I was just one of the writers. You know? I'm like, <laughs> well, this needs more work. And sent it out and it was flat rejected. Not that my opinion was going to matter. Just one of the writers. That sums it up. Just one of the writers. <laughs> <laughs> just one of the writers. I don't think it's ready. What do you know? You know? <laughs> You're a schmuck. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah. So that's uh, so here I just and I found some really good content and also very passionate people, mm-hmm. writers, actors, and and a couple in particular that yeah I think we're going to develop one of them. It's he already wrote it. He already wrote this great TV pilot with a bible for an entire series, an entire season uh, about Detroit cops, hmm. and you know, and it's funny and it's. Uh, it's got twists and turns. It's not, it was really impressive. He's a good actor who wrote it. You find these people that have lived it, yeah. you know, and those are the people that can really write too. And so, yeah, yeah. I wonder if there's, if there's any people out there that are just wondering how to set up their own writer's group in their own um, area, maybe you can just describe what the sort of how, you know, just logistically, how does that writer's group work? And, um, and how did you find people to be a part of it? I, I should say that uh, Bobby Moresco, Bobby Moresco is a writer producer. He's directing something right now with Andy Garcia. He has this group in LA called the Actors Gym. And Bobby, I don't know if you know Bobby, but just one of the most passionate. Just, he was one of the writers of Crash, won an Academy Award for mm-hmm. Crash, uh, co producer on Million Dollar Baby. He's just a guy who was, he lived it, he lived life. He was in hell, grew up in Hell's Kitchen. He studied theater. He studied, you know, he studied, he studied, he studied, and he had a passion for writing and acting and directing. And he would get this group together, the Actors Gym, every Saturday in uh, in Sherman Oaks. And I knew him from the bar I worked at. He would come in and meet, have some meetings once in a while. And then I saw him in the neighborhood, and I, and I started going to this group. And he has a rule, and I've adopted this rule in our group. You bring 10 pages of a screenplay or a, or a TV show or a play. And there are actors in this group that will perform your 10 pages. And then you sit around and discuss it. And you decide in, in its simplest terms, are, is, this, is everyone interested in this story? Is everyone following the story? Does it make sense? Because that's kind of where you're at sometimes. Does it make sense? Yeah. Are you interested? Sure. Do you want to see the next 10 pages? Absolutely. My goal is to just get people to finish, get through that first screenplay. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll say over and over, you know, and you know, your first screenplay, that's just draft number one. But you got to get there. You got to get that last page. So we go in 10 page increments. I have actors and I've just found these people. This guy, Ted Smith, who I think connected us. Yep, yep. Uh, Ted is, he's an engineer by, by trade. But he, he can write. He writes and writes and writes and writes. And he just needed – he wanted an outlet. And this this is what the group kind of is. It's an outlet. And th- the talent's everywhere. I mean, that's the cool thing. You lay out a format, whatever. I mean, you got Keltex. You got this free screenwriting software. People can take that time to understand the software, read more scripts. You can find them on the IMSDB, mm-hmm. get an idea what that format is. And really my goal with everyone else is just help them find that story. You know, help them tell that story. Puke it all out, as my brother once said. Get it out there. And then we can go back and then start from that beginning of that 10 pages. And then help to see if that story still works. Yeah. So do you do, you do it at someone's house? Do you rent a little theater? How, what, what is the actual meeting place like? Uh, there's a, in Monroe, a beautiful theater. Okay. River Raisin, River River Raisin Center for the Arts. Tricky name, but a beautiful theater. Mm-hmm. And the River Raisin allows us to hold our group there. They have rehearsal studios and other spots. So sometimes it's in the theater, sometimes it's down the street. 
at one of the dance studios. And it's a small, I'm in a small town in Monroe, it's 16,000 people. Mm-hmm. They have a beautiful theater and they encourage it. And that's, that's part of it too. They have a theater director that encourages this. He loves it. You know, he's not just a theater person. He's a film guy. Yeah. And, and so we meet there every Sunday. We'll be there again this, this Sunday, four to seven. And and people bring pages. That's the neat thing. I'm like, I have no idea what this is going to be. We said it was going to be a six week workshop, and now we're just discussing that uh, we could possibly pay dues to the theater. And if we can pay dues, people can just come. You know, if you can't afford dues, that's okay. We figure out who can afford what. The theater's open to it, but we can give a little money to them, and they'll open their doors for us when there's nothing going on because they know we're developing things and mm-hmm. and 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 encouraging people to write and you know and just be creative. So. Yeah. So yeah. well, that sounds fantastic. Um, and, and maybe too, we can even, um, if there's anybody in your area that listens to the podcast, um, connect them with you. Um, which yep. kind of, which kind of leads me to my next question. I just like to wrap up these interviews, um, just by asking the guests how people can connect with you, um, Facebook, Twitter, blog, whatever you're comfortable sharing, just, um, you know, tell it to me now and I'll, I'll round it up. I'll put it in the show notes so people can click over to it. Yeah. Great. Um, pretty much I'm on Facebook, Tom okay. Hines. Okay. Okay. Try any S, usually a picture of my kids on it. Okay. We're trying slowly, we'll probably, I know that the River Raisin does have a group page for our group, but I don't really know if it's shared, and I, I don't know how visible it is. But you can find me on Facebook, send me a message, say I'm interested in the group. And yeah, I've, I'm adding people rather than subtracting people, which is really neat. Mm-hmm. We're, we're up to anywhere, our weekends we average 12 to 16 people. We've been going now for eight weeks. And four between four and six scripts, five and six, sometimes seven scripts, ten pages each, and actors act the words and writers, and we all sit around and just talk about it. We mm-hmm. talk about the story, and we're learning more about some of these people. I got filmmakers coming in, this Cameron brothers who just came in, and they're shooting and they're finishing a film right now. So, like I said, Michigan I think is a really deep talent pool, and there's a lot of artists here. So mm-hmm. it's it, it's it's cool. Hopefully yeah, yeah. Uh, we can keep building on it. Yeah. So, Tom, I really appreciate your time. You've been very generous to come on and talk with me today. Um, I wish you luck um, with all, all of your projects, um, and I just really do thank you. This has been a great interview, very insightful, a real, um, you know, look sort of under the hood of, of you know, Gary Marshall and his whole whole troop. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been real, really fun to just kind of reminisce about Gary, too. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So, well, thank you, Tom. As I said, I wish you luck in your projects, and um, we'll talk to you later. Thanks. You too, Ashley. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Yeah, talk to you later. Care. All right, bye-bye. I just want to mention two things I'm doing at Selling Your Screenplay to help screenwriters find producers who are looking for material. First, I've created a monthly newsletter that will be sent directly to producers. Every member of SYS Select can submit one logline per newsletter. I went and emailed my large database of producers and asked them if they would like to receive this monthly newsletter of pitches. So far, I have around 400 producers have signed up to receive it. These producers are hungry for material and happy to read scripts from new writers. So if you want to participate in this pitch newsletter and get your script into the hands of lots of producers, sign up at sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. And secondly, I've partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads services so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, I've been getting five to 10 high quality paid leads per week. These are producers and production companies who are actively looking to buy material or are looking to hire a screenwriter for a specific project. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. These leads run the gamut from production companies looking for a specific type of spec script to produce to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up some sort of an idea or property that they currently have. Producers are looking for shorts, they're looking for features, TV and web series pilots. So it's a huge array of different types of projects that these producers are looking for. And these leads are exclusive to our partner and SYS Select members. To sign up, again, just go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. In the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing actor and director Alexander Nevsky. He's a Russian bodybuilder turned actor star. After talking to him, he really reminds me of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and not just because he's a bodybuilder, but because of his can-do attitude. He's just really upbeat and really positive. He's got a lot of great information um, during the interview next week. And specifically, we're talking about his latest film, an action film that he stars in and directs called Black Rose.
So keep an eye out for that episode next week. Thank you for listening. That's the show.